Hi, my name is Kasia Irvin, and today I will be presenting to you guys liquid nasal G decongestants. First, I'd like to give you a little background. A decongestant or a nasal decongestant is a type of pharmaceutical drug that is used to relieve nasal congestion in the upper respiratory tract. Decongestants are sympathomimetic agents, meaning that they mimic the effects of simulation of the sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system, specifically the hormone epinephrine. Now, the oldest and most important decongestant is ephedrine. It's an alkaloid attained from leaves in the genus ephedra. From this is where it Ephedrine has been used in Chinese medicine for more than 5,000 years. In 1889, pseudoephedrine was first characterized by a German chemist who isolated an Ephraim leaf. In 1927, Phenylephrine was patented and then later came into medical use in 1938. In 1959, Sinex nasal spray was released after three years of testing Medimist. In 1961, oxymetazolin was developed and first sold as a prescription medication in 1996. It then became an over-the-counter drug in 1975. Following this, in 1976, pseudoephedrine was approved by the FDA to become an over-the-counter drug. In 1980, the FDA announced that they needed to reduce the dosage in pseudoephedrine for the over-the-counter drug. In 1985, the FDA stated that all nasal decongestant drugs products are generally recognized as safe and effective and not misbranded. Now for classification. The overall classification is nasal decongestants. Within this, nasal de decongestants are sympathomimetic agents, meaning they stimulate compounds which mimic the effects of endogenous ag agonists of the sympathetic nervous system. These endogenous agonists are alpha adrenergic receptors. The sympathomimetic agents stimulate these receptors and create a response of vasoconstriction. That is why they are generally known as vasoconstrictors. Now for drug names. Now the most common active ingredients in all liquid nasal decongestants are pseudoephedrine, phenylephrine, and oxymetazolin. Phenylephedrine stimulates alpha and beta adrenergic agonists and is also a part of the phenyl phenethylamine and amphetamine chemical classes. Now, phenylephrine is a compound very similar to pseudoephedrine. It's just slightly different, as you can see in the chemical compounds. Now, phenylephrine stimulates the alpha, only the alpha, adrenergic receptor agonist. It has no su substantial effect on the beta adrenergic receptors of the heart, unlike pseudoephedrine. Oxymetazolin stimulates only the alpha-1A adrenoceptor agonist, but all of these chemical compounds are very similar. The, these are the generic names. Now, to your right, you will see the brand names and how these these drugs are marketed. So most commonly known drugs are in bold. So for pseudoephedrine, you'll most commonly see it as Sudafed, Nexafed, or Elixir. You can also see the rest of these. They're just not as popular. And then phenylephrine is known as Sudafed PE. And oxymetazolin is commonly known as Afrin. Drug indications. So pseudoephedrine and phenylephrine and oxymetazolin all work towards sinus and nasal decongestion of the eucian tube congestion due to the common cold, hay fever, allergic rhinitis, sinitis, or other upper respiratory allergies or conditions. Now the only difference is that pseudoephedrine only provides temporary relief while phenylephrine 
is actually used for treatment of this, and oxymetazolin is only for symptomatic relief. Now, these three drugs also do other things. Um, if you have otogia prophylaxis prior to air pressure changes by jet travel, you might want to take pseudoephedrine. Also, you, want, you can take it for the treatment of urinary incontinence in adult patients with stress incontinence due to urethral sphincter weakness. For phenylephrine, you can take it for the treatment of internal and external symptoms of hemorrhoids. For mydriasis induction, before ophthalmic procedures of examination, for the treatment of paroxysmal subventricular tachycardia, for the treatment of mild to severe hypotension, hypotension or shock, drug-induced severe hypotension, septic shock, or traumatic brain injury. For oxymetazolin, you can take it for the relief of ocular pruritus and redness due to minor ocular irritations, or for the treatment of persistent facial erythema associated with acne rosacea. Now, these are the contradictions. If you have any of these issues, you don't want to take these drugs. For pseudoephedrine, if you have any acute myocardial infarctions, angina, cardiac arrhythmia, cardiac diseases, cardiac cardiomyopathy, um, coronary artery disease, or heart failure, hypertension, any of these issues, you do not want to take pseudoephedrine because it can exacerbate these symptoms and it can make things worse for you. You also don't want to take it if you have bronchitis, glaucoma, diabetes, mellitus, emphysema, hyperthyroidism, urinary retention, renal failure, renal impairment, dysphagia, GI obstruction, if you're pregnant or breastfeeding, if you're older or um, an infant or a newborn. For phenylephrine, a contraindication is that the injection method requires a physician you also don't want to take this if you have angina, cardiac disease, heart failure, hypertension, or any heart problems. You don't want to take it if you have pulmonary hypertension, ventricular tachycardia, aneurysm, intracranial bleeding, organic brain syndrome, stroke, sulfate hypersensitivity, because often phenyl phenylephrine is paired with sulfate in the drug. Um, you don't want to take it if you have prostate hypertrophy urinary retention, hyperthyroidism, diabetes, hepatic disease, renal failure, if you're labor, obstetric delivery, pregnancy, breastfeeding, and if you're a child, infant, or newborn, or geriatric. For oxymetazoline, um, contraindications would be accidental exposure, especially with the topical. Um, you don't want to get certain methods of this drug where they're not supposed to be. Also, if you have on contact lenses or any ocular exposure to the topical, you don't want to do that. If you're on um, or using an MAOI therapy, this can cause major drug interaction, which we'll talk about later, and you would not want to take oxymetazoline with MAOIs. Um, if you have cardiac disease, hypertension, cerebrovascular disease, coronary artery disease, diabetes, prostatic hypertrophy, Raynaud's phenomenon, and any of these other diseases, glaucoma, if you're pregnant or breastfeeding as well, and not if you're a young child or infant or newborn. So here are some drug characteristics. So for pseudoephedrine, it has a half-life of six hours for the oral drug, but extended release can range anywhere from nine to 16 hours. It is 25 to 45% orally bioavailable, and the result of toxicity or overdose is that you can present with giddiness, headache, nausea, vomiting, sweating, thirst, tachycardia, precordial pain, palpitations, difficulty urinating, muscle weakness, muscle tension, anxiety, restlessness, insomnia, toxic psychosis, cardiac arrhythmias, circulatory collapse, convulsions, coma, and respiratory failure. For phenylephrine, the elimination ranges between 2.1 to 3. hours after oral or intravenous administrative methods. <clears throat> Ophthalmic can range anywhere from 6 to 8 hours. These are the eye drops. 
It is 38% orally bioavailable. Patients experiencing overdose may present with headache, hypertension, reflex, bradycardia, tingling limbs, cardiac arrhythmias, and a feeling of fullness in the head. For oxymetazolin, there's not much research done on it. There's not much evidence out for it, but I found that the elimination half-life is five to eight hours. It has a high bioavailability. There was a number that was roughly like 96%. I didn't feel like it was accurate, but it has a high bioavailability, and the toxicity of it has not been established yet. So these are the different dosing forms available for these different drugs. For pseudoephedrine, there's really only oral administration, but you do have an oral solid where you can take it as a tablet or a liquid-filled capsule, and you have an oral liquid which can be taken as a solution or syrup with syringe, a teaspoon, etc. cetera. Um, phenylephrine has a lot more dosing forms. You still have oral administration. You also have injectable administration, which we know needs to be done by a physician. There is, um, with the injectable administration, you have intravenous through an IV, intramuscular into the muscle, into the muscle or subcutaneous underneath the skin. There's also inhalation administration. This is the um, spray that you spray in your nose, or they have the little um, bottles that you can inhale through your nose also. Ophthalmic administration is through eye drops, and you have rectal administration, which is through your rectum. For oxymetazolin, you have topical administration, which are creams, ointments, and lotions. These are the administrations that you don't want to get in your eye or anywhere they're not supposed to be. Um, they also have inhalant administrations. There is a spray for oxymetazolin um, and ophthalmic administration, which is the eye drops. So these are the dosages for each of these. We're going to go through every type of administration and the dosages that are recommended for those. So for pseudoephedrine, we only had the oral dosages, but we had the tablets or liquid-filled capsules, and we had the we have the um, extended release tablets. Um, so for the uh, regular release tablets or liquid-filled capsules, for adults, adolescents, and children over 12 years of age, you should only take 60 milligrams by mouth every four to six hours and max 240 milligrams per day. You don't want to take over that. Um, children six to 11 years need to take less, half that much, 30 milligrams by mouth every four to six hours, and they only need to take 120 max per day. For the extended release tablet, adults, adolescents, and children over 12 years of age are the only people recommended to take these extended release. You don't want to offer it to children under 12 and it's roughly the same as um, the regular dosage for children. So you're going to take 120 milligrams by mouth, which is one tablet, every 12 hours. So it's still going to be 240 per day. You don't want to take more than that. So for phenylephrine, um, we had the oral, intravenous, intramuscular, subcutaneous, um, intranasal, ophthalmic, and rectal dosages. So I'll go through those for you. Um, for the oral dosage, which is the regular dosage, you'll have adults and children 12 and older taking 10 to 20 milligrams by mouth every four to six hours. You don't want to take over 60 milligrams per day. Notice that it's different from the pseudoephedrine, which you can take more of. Um, children 6 to 11 years need to only take 5 milligrams by mouth every four to six hours as needed. They don't need to go over 30 milligrams per day. And children four to five years old should take 2.5 milligrams per, by mouth every four to six hours and don't go over 15 milligrams a day. For the intravenous dosage, this is through um, rapid IV injection. You don't want to exceed 0.5 milligrams and the maximum single dose is one milligram by IV. <clears throat> For intramuscular or subcutaneous dosage, um, adults can do two to five milligrams intramuscular and subcutaneously you can range from one to 10 milligrams every 10 to 15 minutes as needed. 
Um, this is rapidly um, active, act, activating, so you can take it more often. For intranasal dosage, you have the percentage of the solution, and that's the one you're going to spray on your nose. For It's only for adult and children 12 years and older, and you want to do two, two to three sprays or drops in each nostril every four hours as needed. But you don't want to use this method beyond three days. It's not recommended. It can actually cause your sinus congestion to come back or worsen or stay longer. So for ophthalmic dosage, these are the eye drops. Um, they're only for adults, children, and adolescents. That's 12 years and older. And you want to put one drop in each eye um, and 15 to 30 minutes before. And you want to repeat this three to, in three to five minute intervals, uh, the maximum dose of three drops per eye. For the rectal dosage, I only suggest this for adults and children 12 and older. Um, it's one suppository dose rectally. You can do up to four times to four times daily, usually in the morning, evening, or after each bowel movement. Oxymetazole in dosage has topical, ophthalmic, and nasal dosage. So for topical, you want to apply a pea-sized amount of cream topically once daily as a thin layer to cover the entire face. You want to avoid contact with your eyes and lips, and you want to wash your hands immediately after applying cream. This was one of the contraindications that you don't want to get this topical where it doesn't need to be, like, in your eyes. For the ophthalmic dosage, the eye drops, um, adults, adolescents, and children six years and older can do one or two eye drops in the affected eye every six hours as needed, but you don't want to exceed the recommended dose because overuse may result in more eye redness and not fix your symptoms. For nasal dosage, you have adults, adolescents, and children six years and older. They can use two to three sprays in each nostril as needed every 10 to 12 hours, and you don't want to exceed two doses within a 24-hour period. And also, again, with the nasal dosage, the nasal administration, you don't want to exceed three days using this administration because prolonged use can result in recurrent or worse in nasal congestion. So I'm going to go through the oxymetazolin drug interactions first because there was a lot more major drug, major and moderate drug interactions that can occur than the other two drugs. So first of all, if you're just like the contraindications, if you have any hypotension or heart problems, you don't want to take this drug. Also, it doesn't react well with any hypotensive medications because the oxymetazolin can reduce the antihypertensive effects of the medicine that you're taking. So the medicines that might be prescribed for hypertension would be like beta blockers, some well-known well -known ones were acibutalol and calcium channel blockers like aplodipin and diuretics like furosemide. You have vasodilators like lisinopril and guanabins like Wytensin. Also, NGO2 receptor blockers you don't want to use with oxymetazolin as well. Um, there are some commonly known examples. So for alpha adrenergic blockers, you also don't want to mix this with oxymetazolin or any of the other drugs because it can reduce the effectiveness. As you know, the oxymetazolin and the other two nasal decongestants they work by agonizing and working with these alpha adrenergic blockers. And so having one that's, I mean, the receptors, having these blockers that are blocking those two things coming together, you won't get the effects. So the, the doxazosin and prazosin are example of alpha adrenergic blockers that you don't want to mix with any nasal decongestants. Um, like the contraindications, if you have any heart problems, um, congestive heart failure medications have major drug interactions with oxymetazolin, and this can enhance entopic pacemaker activity, causing arrhythmias and even heart attack. So examples of congestive heart failure medications are like cardiac glycosides. 
another major drug interaction with oxymetazolin is any MAOIs, sorry. <clears throat> because together, these drugs can cause high blood pressure or hypertensive crisis and even heart attack. Now, besides these major drug interactions, you did have some, we did have a lot of moderate drug interactions that can occur. Some commonly known examples are like caffeine and testosterone. You would just wanna watch that person's heart rate and blood pressure. Um, there's minor drug reactions that can occur with nicotine, but nothing that requires any more than um, watching it. Pseudoephedrine and phenylephrine drug interactions are very similar. Um, both of these drugs have severe inner drug, severe drug interactions that can occur with any other drug with similar properties to themselves. Those are the sympathomimetic properties because the combination of those two drugs together increases the toxicity and you can have a lot of problems by having that much in, it's almost like an overdose, having that much of the same properties in your system. So with ergo alkaloids, that causes a synergistic increase in blood pressure and a risk of ischemia and gangrene. Mixed with cocaine, the pseudoephedrine stimulant and the cocaine stimulant can cause arrhythmias and heart attack. And any other psychostimulants or antidepressants can cause increased risk of hypertensive crisis if taken with pseudoephedrine or phenylephrine. Those were severe drug interactions. There are some major drug interactions that can occur with atropine in a combination because it increases the pressure, pressure effect. But there was also over 150 minor to moderate interactions that can occur with different hypertensive medications and these two drugs. So side effects of taking nasal decongestants. With pseudoephedrine, there are some rare side effects that include convulsions, fast breathing hallucinations, that means seeing, hearing, or feeling things that are not there, increase in blood pressure, irregular heartbeat, continuous shortness of breath, trouble breathing, slower fast heartbeat, unusual nervousness, restlessness, or excitement. The convulsions and the fast breathing hallucinations come from pseudoephedrine being actually a part of the benzoid family. And just like cocaine, it's a stimulant that can cause psycho psychosis. So phenylephrine has some common side effects, but it's just a side effect of too much medicine being absorbed into the body, which is basically increased toxicity. So when you're taking too much or it's being absorbed too fast, you'll have a fast, irregular or pounding heartbeat, headache or dizziness, increased sweating, nervousness, paleness, trembling, trouble sleeping, and note that the above side effects are more likely to occur in children because there are a greater chance that too much of this medicine is being absorbed into their smaller bodies. So some of these side effects may occur and they don't usually need medical attention. They will pass. You just need to adjust to the medicine or dilute it or stop taking it, like stop taking it. Um, for oxymetazolin, there wasn't very many side effects I could find. There are some rare side effects that hardly happen, like rebound congestion or rhinitis medicamentosa. Those are rarely seen, though. Now we're going to talk about pseudoephedrine and pharmacodynamics. Well, we're going to talk about all the pharmacodynamics of the, these three different drugs. So pharmacodynamics is the body's biological response to the drugs. And then we'll go over pharmacodynamics kinematics is refers to the movement of the, th the drugs through the body. So with pseudoephedrine, it acts mainly as an agonist of the alpha 1A and 2A adrenergic receptors. And it's less strongly, but it still works with the agonist of the beta 1A and 2A adrenergic receptors. So these adrenergic receptors produce vasoconstriction, which is used as the decongestion and the treatment of all of your symptoms. So pseudoephedrine is also an inhibitor of norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin transporters by binding to the proteins called sodium-dependent transporters of whatever hormone they're transporting. So the sympathomimetic effects of pseudoephedrine increase in mean arterial pressure, heart rate, and chronotopic response of the right atria. For 
phenylephrine, the pharmacodynamics is that phenylephrine, like we discussed earlier, works with alpha-1 adrenergic agonists that raise blood pressure, dilate your pupils, cause local vas vasoconstriction, and depending on the route and location of administration, which we went through many, the systemic exposure to phenylephrine also leads to agonism of alpha-1 adrener adrenergic receptors, raising systolic and diastolic pressure, as well as peripheral vascular resistance. And cleaves blood pressure stimulates the vagus nerve causing reflex bradycardia. Now you see that why taking this drug when you have heart conditions can be a problem because of how it reacts to the enzymes in the body. So for oxymetazolin, the pharmacodynamics is that it's also sympath sympathomimetic and it selectively agonizes with A1 and partially A2 adrenergic receptors. So these adrenergic receptors result in vasoconstriction like all the others, and it constricts the smaller arterioles of the nasal passageways, producing a prolonged gentle and decongesting effect. This only affects the symptoms. It does not actually treat what's causing your um, runny nose or whatever, or nasal congestion. So these vessels and relief of the nasal congestion, to, and to, it works in two ways. It increases the diameter of the airway of the lumen. Second, it reduces fluid exudation from the post-capillary venules, and it can reduce nasal airway resistance up to 35.7% and reduce nasal mucosal blood flow up to 50%. In addition, the local application of the drug also results in vasoconstriction due to its action on endothelial postsynaptic alpha-2 receptors. This is obviously talking about the topical. It works through your skin. Um, so it causes vasodilation because it, it's centrally mediated inhibition of sympathetic tone via presynaptic alpha-2 receptors. It also elicits relief of conjunctal hyperemia by causing vasoconstriction, vasoconstriction of superficial conjunctival blood vessels. The drug actions has been demonstrated in acute allergic conjunctivitis in chemical chloride for pseudoephedrine, now we're talking about pharmacokinetics. Pharmacokinetics refers to the movement of the drugs through the body. So we're going to talk about how pseudo, pseudoephedrine is absorbed. It's presumed to cross the placenta as well as the blood-brain barrier. And then after it's absorbed, it's distri distributed. Um, it may also be distributed into breast milk. But it's completely metabolized by the liver to nor pseudoephedrine. Ephedrine. The primary active metabolite of the parent, the drug and the metabolite are excreted through the urine with 50 to 75 percent excreted as unmetabolized or unchanged drug. So the rate of urinary excretion is accelerated upon urinary acidification to a pH near 5. So some of the drug is reabsorbed into the kidney tubule and the rate of urinary excretion is slowed. The pharmacological effects of phenylephrine are terminated at least partially by uptake of drug in the tissue. So that's absorption. Clinically significant systemic absorption of ophthalmic formulations is possible. That's the eye drops, especially at higher strengths when the cornea is damaged, so it can absorb more. The volume of distribution at a steady rate ranges from 184 to 543, suggesting high distribution to organs and peripheral tissue. So the phenylephrine is primarily metabolized by the liver and intestine, mostly through the G GI tract, by monoamine oxidase and sulfur transferase. The major metabolite, hydroxymandelic acid, accounts for 57% of the total administered dose. 86% of the dose of phenylephrine is recovered in the urine. Only 16% of the drug is excreted in the urine, unmetabolized or unchanged. With That is with IV administration and it's down to 2.6 after oral administration. So following systemic absorption of oxymetazoline, the drug is approximately 57% bound to human plasma proteins. That's how it's absorbed. In vitro studies, the human liver microsomes showed oxymetazoline was minimally metabolized by the liver. It has a 90%, 96% of the parent drug remaining intact after a 120 minute incubation. And then it's then excreted unmetabolized by both kidneys um, at 30%. And then it also remains in the feces by 10%. So it's not being absorbed well. So I did a study, I looked at a study 
about the effects of pseudoephedrine on the parameters affecting exercise performance. So pseudoephedrine um, is commonly used in decongestants, which is what, we, what we've been talking about, but it's currently banned in sports by the World Anti-Doping Agency because of its stimulant properties. So the stimulant activity is claimed to enhance performance, and that's why it's banned in organized sport. But this meta-analysis wanted to prove that pseudoephedrine, um, like see what the effects are on the factors relating to sports performance. So they did a randomized placebo-controlled trial in a double-blind crossover. All the participants were deemed healthy, and they went and calculated heart rate, time trial performance, rating of perceived exertion, blood glucose, and blood lactate after taking the pseudoephedrine and working out. So across all parameters, effects were trivial, with the exception of heart rate. Your heart rate increased after taking the pseudoephedrine, and there was evidence of a dose-response effect for the time trial and the heart rate with larger doses of it. I looked at another study that also investigated pseudoephedrine in athletes because it's banned. So this study investigated whether a 180 milligram dose of pseudoephedrine ingested 45 minutes prior to exercise enhanced short-term maximal exercise performance. So they also wanted to see if it increased performance or made you better by taking it before you went and um, worked out. So they did also a randomized double-blind crossover study, but they only used healthy male athletes, 22, and they did bench press tasks and total workouts, but they weren't affected by the pseudoephedrine. So lung function was altered by the, the pseudoephedrine and the heart rate was significantly elevated and um, especially following the 30 second sprints. So they, they concluded that the administration of 180 milligram dose increased maximum torque produced in isometric knee extension and produced an improvement in peak power during maximal cycle performance, as well as improving lung, lung function. So the regulation of nasal decongestants in the United States, um, Congress actually passed a law um, called the Combat Methamphetamine Epidemic Act because pseudoephedrine was being used to illegally manufacture methamphetamine. And so they basically just limited over-the-counter sales of ephedrine, pseudoephedrine, and phenylpropylamine. So most states now have laws regulating pseudoephedrine, but you can still get it without a prescription. They're just have, they just have laws requiring that it's sold over the counter, behind the counter, and then you have to go to the pharmacy tech to get it, but you don't need a prescription. Here are my references. Those are my articles. Those are all the websites I use for history, nasal decongestants, pseudoephedrine, phenylephedrine, and oxymetazoline. I hope you guys enjoyed.